Good evening, we are on Friday night, the 17th of September 2021. I never had time to do the other readings yesterday, but I'm now going to continue with this book. It's by Angela Canning, a lady that I know from church and where I live. Uh, it's a biography of these two lovely ladies who are now passed on to the next life. But it's beautiful. Anyone who's heard the other chapters, I'll, I'll put it in the blog because I've done a lot of recording today. But this one I'm going to really enjoy because I love the writing of Angela. It's just wonderful. Chapter 5. 1967, Wise Owl and Barn Owl. When March arrived, the blossoms burst forth smiling, as golden as the spring sun. Bobby's spirit was alive and with us, as bright as he had always been. The strange thing was that little Eno always chose that shrub to lie under, panting after he'd been scampering around as if he knew it was something special. He was a cute little chap and had grown to three quarters of his full size. He would trot around with us inquisitively and dancing on his back legs to see into the cages as we performed our rounds. The spring approached and by May we were immersed with the usual boxes of nestlings and fledglings in their numbers and we worked tirelessly. The strong survived and the weak succumbed. But it was a well rewarding task. Yet not only did the feathered creatures find their way to us, but a surprising number of other things. And when one morning... Brian Sanders popped his head round the unlocked door and called, Anyone at home? He had brought a little white kid. Someone found her tethered in a lane, starving. She was left by gypsies. As you see, she only has one teat. I said I thought, I knew someone who would take her. He ventured apologetically, although I know you are a wildlife hospital. Bring her in, we chorused. The little animal's ribs were like a greyhound's, her spirit downcast. Come along, Lucy, I said, without thinking, giving her a huge bowl of milk, plus apples and carrots, which she munched hungrily, and then I attempted to comb her matted hair. When Brian had departed, we put her to roam freely in the garden and at night made her a comfortable bed of straw in the shed. After a week or two, we were pleased to see that her coat was becoming healthy again, as a Seonens should be and her body was gradually putting on flesh. Also, we thought she was happy, and she didn't take long to prove it. Each morning, as we opened her shed door, she bounded out, leaping around like a springbok, as skittish as young goats are. We became attached to her, and every day we took her for walks with us, over the swing bridge and back past the lock so that she could get her natural food leaves and plants. There she always met John Gould with Buffer, who made a fuss of her and she would chomp away happily, pruning his rose bushes. But one day Lucy went missing. We searched for her everywhere in the garden but she was nowhere to be seen, and we became worried. An hour passed, and a telephone call came from a shop owner to say that she was down Northbrook Street, the main street of Newbury, in the busy road. We hurried down and fetched her, bringing her back on a lead, and put her in the garden again. 
Once Lucy had savoured the delights of the wild world outside, she found the grass on the other side greener. One day, John Gould rang the doorbell. Look who I found outside Woolworths, he announced. It was Lucy, attached to a piece of string. Whatever can we do with you, Lucy? gasped Yvonne, her hands on her hips. We've only just mended that fence. We didn't want to keep her tethered. John had a paddock and a good high fence, and an idea crept through my mind. I knew he had an eye for Lucy, and I ventured, Would you like her? The thought had not occurred to him, and he considered for a moment. Well now, what would you say, Buffer? Buffer looked up and gave a woof of approval. The matter had been decided, and so Lucy went to live at the lock keeper's cottage, where all the passers-by got to know her and would offer her a titbit from their lunch. It became common even to see John walking down the town with her on a lead, or to the vet to have her hooves trimmed, as is the proper care of goats. Not a soul batted an eyelid. The rector of St Nicholas Church also knew her well, and one Christmas a request came for her to take part in the forthcoming nativity play. Would she mind standing by the crib? Lucy had no objections and played her part so well that she could have won an Oscar. Years later, we heard that Lucy had died. She'd lived to the age of 16, and because she had been associated with holy matters, the Reverend Chris Savage buried her solemnly in the churchyard. Meanwhile, Brian called again, and as he sipped his mug of tea with Eno on his lap, he remarked, What about that, Avery? Don't you think it's about time you had one? You have room in the back garden. I looked at him surprised. Avery's were expensive. And we well knew that our pin money was needed for feed and medical care of the patients. We should need at least fifty pounds, I commented. He winked. I might know where I can find it. Are you going to do a robbery? Maybe, he held his head giving a chuckle and depositing Eno on the floor, departed to his next call so that we forgot all about it. The next newcomer was a feral pigeon. We had many pigeons to take care for, but this one was so identical to Percy with his orange eyes, metallic green neck feathers and white and grey of the rest of his body that we named him Percy too. We did not know that Percy too was to become as special as the first. Brian turned up two weeks later and to our surprise had a letter in his pocket. We tore it open. Inside was a cheque for £50 worth £500 today. We will have that Avery up in no time, he said. Better get planning permission. It took us just three weeks to obtain it from the council and we were ready to go. Brian arrived with the materials, cement, post, netting, wood, varnish, nail, screws, hinges and lock. Enough to build an Avery 20 feet in length and 12 feet wide. We got to work that very day. With great enthusiasm, we set the posts in concrete. When sufficiently firm, we secured the netting all round. At the weekend, we began building the partitions, double doors and lastly made a good strong roof. It was a marvellous job and took up the whole of the back garden. It had taken the three of us a fortnight to build. 
It happened to be September, and excitement reigned in the town. This month there was to be a Newbury Festival Week, a week that purported to be crammed with events, terminating in a carnival. A coachload was expected to join in the celebrations from Newbury's twin town of Braunfels in their honour. A German beer garden had been arranged in Victoria Park, accompanied by lusty beer-drinking songs played from the bandstand. On the opening day, Sunday the 17th, which is the same day now, 17th of September 2021, there was to be a concert in the Corn Exchange given by the Newbury Festival Concert Orchestra and the Newbury Operatic Society. During the week, there would be shows, dances and exhibitions, a pop music competition in the Corn Exchange, judged by the well-known radio disc jockey Tony Blackburn. While throughout the Friday night, a £450 ox would begin to roast on a spit in the market square to be ready to be partaken of by all next day at the council carnival. To rule over all the proceedings, there would be a festival queen. She would be chosen from amongst the local pretty girls at a grand ball to be held in the plaza on the 7th, and two of the judges would be the well-known Newbury radio star Basil Jones, who played John Tregoran in The Arches, and Neil McCullum of the BBC TV's Vendetta. When the evening of the ball arrived, the band struck up the opening music and the atmosphere was electric. Twelve lovely finalists lined up before the jury to be chosen for their personality, grace, beauty and ability to converse. The winner was selected at last. It was 20-year-old Christine Jones, a hotel receptionist at the Chequers. And amidst great applause, the Mayor, Councillor Christopher Hall, placed the crown on her head. Christine's first engagement would be to attend the Newbury Agricultural Show the day before the festival began, to host functions throughout the week, to assist Tony Blackburn with the judging of the Pop Music Festival on the Tuesday, and her last to ride in honour in a 1930 Lancaster car at the Newbury Carnival. And on Monday the 18th, her duty was to open our aviary. The aviary stood smart and ready. A white ribbon hung across its double doors, while shrubs and trees containing roosting boxes decorated the edges. It looked a treat and a credit to Brian's intuition. The awaited day proved warm and sunny. At two o'clock, a crowd comprising Brian and Betty, his wife, the chairman of the RSPCA fundraising committee, several RSPCA members, John Gould, our neighbours, friends and a host of onlookers, together with a reporter from the Newbury Weekly News, waited expectantly. Christine had been spotted rounding the church in the official car. She stepped out, the sun illuminating her beautiful blonde hair, piled high upon her head and enhancing her bright blue sash, worn from her shoulder bearing the title Newbury Festival Queen. Elegantly she walked towards the hospital, shook hands with us with a smile and we led her to the back garden. My goodness, it's magnificent! she exclaimed upon seeing the aviary. Ceremoniously, she cut the ribbon 
and announced that it was officially open. Everyone cheered and bottles of champagne were popped. Would you like to see round the hospital, we asked, and then prevailed upon her to perform the honour of releasing Percy too, who was now ready to go. She took him delightedly in her hands. Percy too, apprehensive at first, gave a quiet woo-woo in his affectionate way as she spoke to him, then balancing himself on the palm of her hand, made his departure, soaring into the air and alighting on the church roof. Then, as if considering what to do, he took off, circling in the air and flew away. On Thursday, it came about that Percy too was given a special mention along with our hospital in a five and a half inch column on the festival page in the Newbury Weekly News. Oh, how splendid. That's the end of chapter five. Thank you so much for listening. That was slightly shorter than the others. And in a little while, I might do chapter six. God bless you all and thank you for listening.